Welcome everyone today to the second um, webinar in our webinar series on Towards Fair Digital Twins. Um, welcome. Um, we're recording the webinar today and this will be available on our YouTube channel after the event. The chat box is open to everyone and the question and answers, the Q&A box uh, is also open, so please ask your questions there. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick brief overview of the agenda. We have firstly Dr. Sharif Islam from the Naturalis Biodiversity Centre and Work Package 5 leader of the BioDT project here with us. And he is going to um, welcome you and give you an introduction to the BioDT project and introduce uh, Professor Daniel S. Katz, who is Chief Scientist at the National Centre for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois, Urba Illinois Urbana Champaign in the USA. Um, and I'll be moderating the chat and the Q&A. So um, I'll give it over to you, Sharif. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. Uh, yeah, let me okay. share the screen. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as uh, we already mentioned, uh, we organized uh, this webinar to understand uh, uh, sort of the fair aspect of digital twin uh, within the uh, BioDT project. And in a, in a brief moment, I will uh, talk about a little bit uh, what this project is and what, what we're trying to do. Uh, one of the idea behind this uh, project was to, or this webinar was to think about the different components uh, that goes towards digital twins. When we started thinking about FAIR within this project, we immediately understood that it, it's not just about the data, there are a variety of different components that will come and create this digital twin uh, or different twins. Uh, even though the idea of digital twin is uh, fairly, you know, old, uh, it, it has, you know, been used in, in industry and other other domains within biodiversity is fairly new. So uh, it's also sort of a challenge for us to understand what, what it means. So I know uh, you haven't come here to listen to me, so I will be brief uh, with my few slides. So just to set the scene, um, just quickly to give you a re recap, like what we actually mean by digital twin, there's different implementation of that. Basically, we want to mimic the behavior, uh, what we observe in nature in a different context, different use cases, uh, different position. Uh, there are specific use cases that are guiding uh, some of this uh, uh, interaction. And there's a larger European project called Destination Earth that is creating a digital twin of the whole world, Earth uh, in, a, in a larger scale. And we also want to contribute towards that as well. And if we started looking into this uh, more uh, Objective wise, we have primarily three goals. Uh, of course, we want to build the digital twin and platform. Uh, however, uh, the main target of the project at the moment is sort of a pre operational or, or a prototype of that. And there are several research infrastructures involved, the European research infrastructures, also global partners uh, that will work with that uh, platform. And then, of course, interoperability with other uh, European uh, initiatives, uh, digital twin initiatives. So here's an example of some of the components uh, that I mentioned. Uh, from the data and services side, you, you, you see some of the research infrastructure I mentioned. Uh, GBF, Disco, Elter, and LifeWatch are the primary partners. However, we also have data sources that the use cases are using that are coming from uh, other places as well. And the idea is to sort of create a, a fair digital object uh, interoperability layer uh, for all of these components. Again, it's not just about the data, we have software model and workflow coming together uh, into this uh, digital twin uh, application. And a little bit more thinking about this, uh, we have trying to figure out how exactly some of this interaction will work. And one of the implementation that we have seen within the digital twin domain, it's called this physics informed neural network module. Uh, it's basically a module that has parameters and of course software and models that requires you know a virtual representation so this could be you know a picture of a tree or some data or even some complex phenomena but idea is that that we want to have, have that connection but most importantly you know we have to follow sort of or implement this life cycle of action to analyzing and to decision 
and this is where uh, digital twin uh, comes to you know to life, and different than just a simulation and model. So this this component of the parameters and this neural network module is very important, where all of these components will come in, and 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 that's where we want to look at the software and other components as as the fair perspective as well. So I think this sort of gives you an idea the complexity we're dealing with. So with this uh, quick background, I will hand things over to Dan. As uh, already mentioned, Dan comes from the uh, National Center for Supercomputer Application. He's the chief scientist there, uh, which is an amazing institution. I used to work there. Uh, it's uh, situated in the University of Illinois, and he's one of the leading uh, figures in FAIR and FAIR for software, and really a oh, great honor to, be, uh, to have him here. And he will talk about what FAIR means for research software, in particular uh, connection with HPC. And during the discussions and Q&A, we also want to explore what it means for, for digital twin or, or BioDT in particular. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Dan. OK, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, this is a, a, the area of digital twins is one that I've been kind of interested in for a very long time. Um, probably before it had that name. And uh, and so I hope this is a helpful talk in terms of thinking in this way. Um, I, I will say just to start that I did um, watch the recording of the last talk, which I wasn't able to attend. Um, and I think I will say some things that are probably a little bit different than the last speaker. Uh, and uh, if I'd been there, probably would have disagreed with some of the, the things. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what everybody thinks after, the, after these two different versions. So yeah, so I'm going to talk um, about the FAIR principles for research software and, and a little bit about some work that we're starting to do on FAIR principles for machine learning models um, and, uh, and uh, kind of try to tie that to HPC a little bit as well. Okay. So um, as, as probably everybody knows, the FAIR principles uh, came out in 2016 based on work that had kind of started more formally in 2014. Um, and they are a set of principles that are intended to ensure that data are shared in a way that enables and enhances reuse by humans and machines. And they fall into these four different categories of, of findable, um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm not going to go into the details of this at this point, because this isn't really a talk about the, the original FAIR principles, which I will call the FAIR data principles from time to time. Um, but instead want to want to talk about things that aren't data. So, so specifically, if, if we think about things that aren't data, um, these FAIR principles that were created uh, at a high level were intended to apply to all research objects. Um, those that were created, uh, sorry, let me, there's something, uh, both those that are used in research and those that are the outputs of research. And the, the text and the principles, as you saw, often includes this term uh, meta in parentheses and data. And this is shorthand for metadata and data. Um, and the people that were working on these principles and writing them wanted to write them as concisely as possible. Uh, the, the principles themselves are um, viewed in a world where there are kind of two really main parties. Uh, there are data set creators, and then there are repositories. And collectively, those two parties are responsible for creating, annotating, indexing, preserving, and, and sharing the data sets and their metadata. Um, this is uh, this bakes into this process the idea that there is a data set creator um, who is a different person than the or a different role than the repository, and that the creation happens and then the repository action happens. Uh, there's creation and then publication. Um, and if we think about non-data objects, they can often be stored as data, but they're not just data. The, these high-level goals of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable are really pretty close to the same for these objects, but the details of, of them and, and how they're actually implemented really depend um, very specifically on how the different kinds of objects are created and used, um, how and where the objects are stored and shared, and how and where metadata is stored and indexed. And the point that I'm going to try to make is that these things are all different than the assumptions that were made when the FAIR principles were originally created for data. The, the, for things that aren't data, uh, these are different than for data. 
Um, and because of that, there is work that's needed to define and implement and adopt these principles at the level below, uh, again, the, the top level. So um, uh, again, FAIR principles were intended to apply to all digital objects, um, but it's been recognized that that's not so straightforward. The FAIR practice task force at EASC in, in 2020 had six recommendations for implementation of FAIR practice and recommendation five was to recognize that FAIR guidelines require translation for other digital objects here, other is other than data, uh, and that, that such effort needs to be supported. Uh, in 2019, the French National Committee for Open Sciences Free Software and Open Source Project Group had an opportunity note, and one of the recommendations there was to make sure the specific nature of software is recognized and, and not considered as just data, uh, particularly in the context of, of the discussion of FAIR data. Um, and so the work that I'm going to talk about has really been focused on the adaptation and adoption of the FAIR principles to research software, at least the, the first part of this. So um, there are a bunch of different efforts that have happened over time. There's uh, work on FAIR computational workflows that was uh, led by Carol Goble, who I think was on the last, uh, the, the previous webinar in the series. Um, there's work on making training materials FAIR um, that has happened. There is work on virtual research environments, uh, which in the US are called science gateways, um, but a uh, similar idea. Um, there's work on uh, FAIR principles for machine learning, which I'll touch on at the end of this talk. Um, and and so, right, so, so a bunch of different areas that people have been working in. Um, specifically looking at software then, why is software not just data? Right? It, it certainly can be stored as data, but it isn't data. Um, and some of the reasons are that software is executable while data is not. Uh, data is providing evidence and software is really providing a tool. Um, software is a creative work where data typically are facts or observations and have uh, sometimes can be creative in how they're presented, but the data themselves are usually not creative. Um, and so this leads to different licensing and copyright practices. The licenses that you use for software are not the licenses that you use for data and vice versa. And, and there are different issues around copyright as well in various countries. Um, Data has this issue of bit rot, where the where you may not be able to read the bits over time. Uh, software has that, but it also has the fact that the, the software itself can collapse because software is, is built in a complicated stack and it has a lot of dependencies and the things in those dependencies can change, the API, the uh, uh, different issues, or your software may be built on Python 2 and then you have to change it to Python 3 or it doesn't work. Um, so, so that's uh, an issue for software that doesn't exist for data. Um, the lifetime of software is generally not as long as that of data. Uh, this isn't a, an absolute statement. It's a, a bit of a generalization, but, but it's kind of true. Um, and then maybe one of the biggest things is that for open source, we don't actually follow this idea of having a sequential creator and then a publisher. Uh, this process doesn't work. And in fact, there is no natural idea of a publisher uh, an archival repository for software. That's not the way open source software is typically distributed or used or, or contributed to. So um, yeah, so, so, so there's a bunch of different reasons that software, even though it can be stored as data, is, is not just data. So in order to address this then, we had a working group that started to define uh, FAIR principles for research software. And it was led by uh, by nine of us, as you see here. And then we ended up uh, working through subgroups. And in one phase, we had some additional subgroup leaders that came in. And I just want to recognize all the all the people that have played a, a leadership role in one way or another. Um, and we did this work under three different organizations: uh, Force Eleven, uh, which is focused basically on, uh, on on the act of publishing and and how research and scholarship is communicated. Uh, research Data Alliance that's focused on data and, and the use of research and the Research Software Alliance that's focused on software and research. We started by, um, by defining research software and the definition that we came up with, which is uh, defined in a link on the bottom uh, or on the lower right side at least, is that research software includes source code files, algorithms, scripts, computational workflows, and executables that were created during the research process or for a research purpose. And so there's there's two different pieces here. There's what does research software look like? And in some sense, what does software look like? And then what software is research software? 
Um, there's additional software that is used for research, but if it wasn't created during or with a research intent, we would call it software in research and not research software, things like uh, operating systems, libraries, packages, scripts. Um, and, and it's worth saying that this differentiation varies between disciplines. So if you are a, uh, uh, let's say you're uh, working in, in genomics, um, the algorithms that you're using are, are part of your research software. Um, the compiler is probably not part of your research software. But if you're working in computer science, the compiler might be part of your research software, particularly if you're doing research into languages or, or compiling. OK, so what we ended up doing uh, after about uh, 18 months was to come up with a, a new set of FAIR principles, FAIR principles for research software specifically, uh, published on the link on the top through RDA. Um, and these are that the software and its associated metadata is, is easy for humans and machines to find as the findable one. Uh, accessible is that the software and its metadata are retrievable via standardized protocols. Um, you can see that these are basically the same as the FAIR data principles, other than some language changes. Um, and so that's why these are in uh, a standard text. And then uh, interoperable and reusable, we really had to redefine. And, and they're in italics because they're significantly different than the FAIR data principles. Um, so interoperable specifically, we defined as interoperate, it's how software interoperates with other software. Um, by exchanging data or through interaction through APIs and that those both should be described through standards. And reusable, we defined as saying that first the software is, is usable, that it can be executed, and then that it can be reused, which can mean that it can be understood or modified or built upon or incorporated into other software. Um, there's a lot of details in how software is used and reused. To go into these in a little bit more, more detail, um, the findable principles, again, are pretty similar to the data principles, but the things that are really different are that um, software has uh, levels of granularity from lines of code to files to uh, directories to repositories, uh, in, this, in the sense of source code repositories like GitHub or GitLab, for example, um, and that each level should have distinct identifiers, and that software has versioning really built in, uh, that software is not static, it's dynamic, it's, it's always changing. Um, and that those different versions also get different identifiers. Uh, and then the rest of the findable um, principles are, are pretty similar. Uh, in terms of accessible, the principles really are generally very similar overall, and I'm not going to talk about this in any detail. Um, interoperable, I, again, I defined what interoperable means for us. It's the, how software interoperates with other software. And this then leads to, to two uh, sub-principles that, that the, the way software reads and writes and exchanges data is done in a way that meets domain relevant community standards and that the software includes qualified references to those other kinds of objects. And for reusable, uh, again, I defined the, the top part of this before, um, the main piece is that software needs to include qualified references to other software as a, as a difference from the FAIR principles for data, though the rest of this is actually fairly similar. So, um, so these, again, I think the, the main point here is that because software is different for data, the principles themselves in some cases also need to be different, although in a lot of cases the principles are similar. If we then think about actually applying these principles, um, it, I think we, we've said that the application of the principles is the responsibility of the owners of the software, and typically the creators, not the users. Um, that's similar to data, um, but it's worth just saying. Um, the FAIR principles also have to be enabled and supported by the stakeholders in the larger ecosystem that supports research software. And so this includes repositories and, and registries, um, but it also includes open source systems and package management systems, distribution systems, things like that. Um, we can think about this as a, uh, uh, as a pyramid in some sense, um, that we need infrastructure that makes it possible to, to apply FAIR for research software principles. We need skills and training that make it possible for people to do this and, and easy for them to do it. We need communities to support this so that it just becomes part of the, the standard practices of those communities. We need, we need incentives 
that makes it rewarding for people to do this and encourages people to, to do this because it's part of what they're going to get rewarded for. Um, and we need policies at the highest level that make it required by, uh, by funders, by um, repositories and registries, by institutions, by others. Okay, so having come up with these principles then, we did a little bit more work. Um, we surveyed some adoption guidelines that different organizations were starting to, to put out. Um, and then we actually studied how some of those adopting organizations were thinking about this. And so, um, sorry, I didn't say this before, I think it's in chat, but the, all these slides are, my slides are on Zenodo and the documents that I'm pointing out, I'm also trying to provide links to whenever I can. Uh, so if you're interested in this, you can find more information. Um, what we think are the next things that we would, we would literally like to see happen is to see scholarly societies and, and librarians develop guidance that are aimed specifically at their communities. Um, individuals and, and software projects um, should actually working to make their software fair. Uh, we think publishers should require fair software when software is a key part of a publication. We think that funders should require fair software, uh, specifically when software is being funded explicitly and as much as possible when software is part of a funded project, even if it's not the outcome of the project, if it's just part of the research of the project. And finally, that institutions should incentivize and evaluate their employees based in part on the fairness of the software that they produce. Um, in terms of governance, it's uh, one of the things that we found with the FAIR principles for data is that there was no process for governance. The, there was work done to publish a paper and then different things happened after that. Um, and if you have questions about what does FAIR mean for data in some case, there's not really an obvious way to solve that. Uh, there is GoFair and, and there are other uh, groups that have formed, but they're kind of follow on as opposed to uh, immediate uh, successors. So in this case, um, in order to address that, we decided we would turn over governance to the RDA Software Source Code Interest Group. Um, and the idea is that if you have concerns or queries about the FAIR for Research Software Principles, you can raise these at the Software Source Code Interest Group events at RDA plenaries. And this is also a place where adopters can report back on their progress. Um, we are planning for that group then to review the principles two years after they were published and, and possibly update them if that's needed. Uh, this is now uh, about a year and four months from now in, in May of 2024. Um, there is also a full maintenance and, and retirement plan for the principles on the RDA website. Um, beyond the FAIR for, for research software principles themselves, we have the fact that these principles expose a bunch of different ecosystem gaps, um, and they're particularly related to metadata and archiving and versioning. And so these gaps include the fact, as I said before, that uh, if you're building open source software, you're typically doing it on, on GitHub or GitLab or something like that. And, and there's no real need for you to publish it on a archival repository like Zenodo um, in order to share it. You, right, you, you, you share it because people can look at the source code while you're writing it. And you share it because you create versions and you put those th into a package management system like uh, PyPy or CRAN or something like that. Um, so, so there's a question here about how we actually deal with this kind of archival publishing part for research software. Um, there's a question about metadata. Where do you actually put the metadata about the software? Where do you put the information about who wrote it, how you want the software to be referred to, how you want it to be cited, for example? Um, maybe this is part of the code repository. If it's open source, there's a couple of different standards that have come up, uh, citation.cff and and codemeta.json are two different standards to do this. Um, but if the software is closed source, where do you put the metadata? Um, do you put this in an archival repository? Do you put this in a registry? Um, again, where do you actually archive the code? Um, GitHub and GitLab are not archival. They both may go away at some point um, in the future. Uh, the software registries are not archival. The software package management systems are are archival in some sense, but they don't necessarily have any kind of a preservation plan for what happens if they go away. Um, repositories generally are archival and they do have such a, a plan. Uh, software heritage is another kind of key uh, interesting element here that is um, basically trying to uh, capture and, and archive uh, work that's going on in open source repositories. Um, there's also a huge amount of work beyond FAIR. Right, FAIR is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. 
it doesn't say anything about quality, it doesn't say anything about correctness or robustness or reproducibility or openness or citability. Um, so having fair research software is good, but it doesn't actually mean that the software is, is useful uh, or correct or, or a bunch of other things. Um, so I think there's really a lot of work needed on all those other aspects as well. Um, okay, so, so having talked about fair for research software, how does this actually apply to HPC or what's different in HPC? What's, what's special about HPC in the context of fair for research software? Um, one possible answer is scale. Um, and, and I think the answer is, is yes, scale is, is important, um, but it doesn't really matter to FAIR research software. The, the scale that we're talking about for HPC is different than the scale of the software itself. And so this is probably not the, the relevant importance. Um, the ecosystem, um, yeah, so the, the HPC ecosystem really is important, and this does matter for FAIR for research software, at least uh, it does in practice. The issue is that each HPC system really is unique in terms of the system and its policies. Um, the, the details of the system, the hardware, the internal and external networks, the storage, uh, the policies like authentication, authorization, access and firewalls, job submission, the, the paths and environment, the build system, containerization, um, all these things are quite different on almost all HPC systems. And in effect, there really are not standards for HPC systems in, in terms of systems and policies and how you interact with them. Um, and, and so then this leads into issues when we talk about interoperable and reusable in FAIR for research software. Right? We talk about standards in both of these cases in terms of how interaction happens, uh, in terms of domain relevant community standards, and in terms of reusability. Um, and to some extent, these standards are domain standards, but in some cases, they have to incorporate HPC practices as well. And when we don't actually have HPC standards, um, it's hard to know exactly how this works, right? When, when an API could be different on one HPC system to another, um, how do you make software fair, for example? Um, and so I, I think that the conclusion here is that interoperable and reusable for HPC in particular are really very hard and that we need more research in terms of thinking about how these things apply and, and really how they're how they are done in practice primarily. Okay, so that's um, that's what I wanted to say about fair for research software. I just uh, want to provide a few slides for fair for machine learning models because I think this is also pretty relevant to uh, to digital twins. Um, as I've previously said, the original principles focus on uh, claim to apply to, to scholarly research, uh, scholarly digital research objects, but they really focus primarily on metadata and data. The fair for research software work, as well as some of the fair for workflow work that's been done, uh, focused on how to translate and interpret those principles for those two kinds of objects. Machine learning models are kind of an interesting thing as well. Um, you could think of machine learning models potentially as being data, like a, a set of parameters and, and options for a particular framework, or maybe if you're thinking about Onyx, uh, maybe it's more general. Uh, machine learning models could be software. Uh, there, you could think of them as an executable object that takes some input and provides some output. Um, you could think of them as a combination of data and software and workflows, and, and maybe there's something else. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting challenge that we really are just starting to, to think about. If we think about how FAIR gets applied, uh, as, I've, as I've said before, lots of parts of FAIR for data are dependent on archival repositories. Um, these are what hold the data and or the metadata, and they provide the search and access capabilities. Um, as I was saying again, software, this doesn't work for because it's not typically shared through archival repositories, but it's shared through social coding platforms like GitHub and, and package, package management systems. For machine learning models, we don't really know how this is going to work yet. Um, you could certainly put machine learning models into repositories. You could build executable platforms that run machine learning models. Um, or you, there are some, some existing uh, systems uh, like uh, DL Hub and OpenML and, and a few others that, um, that are also doing this. But in general, the, we don't have metadata standards for how these can be searched. Uh, and these are not federated. So there's no way of searching across these. You can only search one at a time. Um, also, models and training data are strongly linked together. Right? A model is the model because of the data that it was trained on and how it was trained. 
And so should these be shared together or do we just want to share the models and, and have the training data maybe being linked but not shared directly with the model? So um, just to, again, just to mention kind of where things are here, we have a fair for machine learning interest group that we just have started. Uh, we started talking about this in, uh, uh, in RDA uh, VP16 that was uh, about uh, getting close to two years ago. And then in, the, in two different sessions, we uh, the next two different RDAs, we had boffs to talk about ideas and discuss them. Um, and we led in VP19, which was about six months ago, into a, a proposed interest group that was then approved. Um, and so we're going to have our first meeting in uh, Gothenburg in March of this interest group. And we're going to really talk about what does the interest group want to do? Um, what are the, the first things that we want to work on? And we think most likely we'll start working towards a, a white paper to think about, to, to define what are the challenges that we need to, to focus on. Uh, again, the, the group is really aimed at thinking about where does FAIR apply to machine learning? Um, what are the, the, the things that we need to work on within there? And to, um, in the end, build a community of practice for sharing information about how FAIR pertains to machine learning. Okay, so just to, to wrap up, um, back to the mostly the FAIR for Research software part, I want to kind of thank all the contributors that worked on this over a year and a half to two years. Um, we had about 500 people that contributed in, in various ways, uh, including the, the steering committee folks, um, and we had funding from the uh, Sloan Foundation and from the Wellcome Trust. And uh, again, there's a link just to the, to the page that we have. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. And on to uh, questions potentially. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. This is uh, really amazing. And uh, even though I've been dealing with FAIR for a long time, you always learn something new and, and interesting. For example, like, I never thought about the governance part, uh, as you explained, like where, where do you go for some of these questions? I think that's a very, very important point. Um, I like. Uh, so one question I want to uh, ask, uh, just to a very broad general idea, is that the way you described fair for data and then fair for software that that required you to think about fair for research software, fair for machine learning, um, is it time to for us to think about fair for digital twin? And what what are the process and or should we focus on the components or is it as a whole? What what would be your sort of approach? Yeah, I, I have to say, I don't know that there is an answer to that yet. I, I think that um, I think that looking at it from both points of view, kind of in parallel, is probably worthwhile at this point until um, until there's kind of better resolution about that. Because, um, as as you said in your slides, I think that, right there are all the different aspects of digital twins, and um, and it. I think clearly they can all be looked at independently um, in terms of their fairness, and I think that's that makes sense to do. Um, but then the question is, are there aspects that get lost if you look at each thing independently and you're not looking at everything together? Um, and my guess is that there probably will be. I, I mean, I feel like this is kind of similar in the, the machine learning models where we don't really know yet if we want to, to, to share the models and the training data together or, or not. Um, I think the answer probably is going to be yes in the end, but um, but I don't know. And so similarly, I think that for the for the digital twins, the answer probably will be yes in the end as well. But I don't think that you can really do that without starting um, kind of about thinking of each individually and then seeing where gaps are when you try to try to apply that in the end. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a that's a very very important point. Uh, we're also uh, within from within our project, we're also trying to reach out to other digital twin projects. And one of the thing also we noticed that within each projects, we also have different understanding of FAIR. Uh, so that has to probably uh, uh, converge at some point as well. Okay, let's uh, go to the Q and A. Um, yes, uh, there's a question from Julian. Uh, within BioDT, there might be researchers from different domains and different parts of the project who are developing software uh, independently. What do you think is the best way for domain experts uh, who are probably new to FAIR to follow this uh, FAIR for research uh, guidelines and align on them while working on the on the software? Um, yeah, so uh, so it actually this, the question actually says while well, not working on the same software, which is uh, which is interesting. Um, 
I'm, I have to say, I'm actually not completely sure if I understand this question well enough. No, to... I think uh, this is coming also from, uh, so basically the way we're structuring the research cases, uh, there are common elements for these use cases. So there might be different softwares, um, but the science questions might be the same. Uh, yeah, so basically the, the you know, each, each use case will bring their own sort of homemade software. Uh, however, we want them to kind of work together within the digital twin environment. Um, um, yeah, so I, I, well, I guess I, I see multiple, um, multiple aspects here. Um, so one of them is just how the different pieces of software work together overall. Uh, which is really kind of a, a project coordination question and a project organization question and and most likely just gets handled through through communication and, and people talking to each other. Um, the other one is uh, is actually then applying fair to that in a uh, both in an individual ways and and in a collective way. And I think I guess to me the this maybe requires um, at least somebody that kind of specializes in in thinking about fair and how it applies. Uh, kind of in the same way that you think about um, uh, about specialists that work on research data, um, or data curators, uh, uh, people that have expertise in, in fair for data that can kind of come in and, and talk with individual researchers and individual, in this case, software developers, and and try to to help them and can answer questions when they have them. Um, and then the other part of it maybe is kind of this kind of collective question about uh, how the different um, how the different pieces of software are working together and how FAIR actually applies within that process. And I think there the question is um, kind of gets into this idea of, of what are the what are the, the community standards that are needed. And so I think that kind of also then gets to kind of goes back to the project as a whole and maybe the project representing the, the larger area. Um, and, and so then maybe there is some some work that's either uh, needed to either document or or to define depending on what what the state of things is um what are the standards for how software is going to work together in this in this area um overall and and i guess i'll, I'll just say that the this idea of community standards probably as a bunch of people know is often is the is the hardest um part of this getting people to agree on things is is much harder than getting software to work together um, and, and again, it seems like it just happens through through communication and through use cases that require it. Um, so maybe that's maybe if I was going to say kind of any any last piece on this, it would be um, when the project is working on use cases to try to think about them as generally as possible and not just to be limited to the very specifics of a given use case, but to think about how somebody in five years is going to be is going to be working. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And also, uh, sometimes we do have legacy software where probably the current maintainer is, is also not the original uh, programmer that worked on it. So there's also sort of those gap in, in, in knowledge. Uh, no, I think that that definitely a good point. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, okay, the next one is from Christos. Um, the main point here is to think if digital twins have attributes which cannot be found in any of their constituent components do they yeah i um i have to say i don't know that that's a question i can answer i feel like maybe that's one that um that you can answer better than i can but i i guess i would say that um as i was saying before i think it's a it's not it may be one that can be best done through uh through trial um just to to try and, and find out um I, I think if uh Again, if the easiest thing to do is to think about the constituent components first and to see then if that causes any gaps and anything that needs to be thought of at a, at a higher level. And, and again, I would guess that it probably will, but I don't think that I have any idea what what those gaps are going to be yet and, and how that's going to work. So I, again, I think this is going to be an iterative process of the of this project going forward. Exactly. Yeah. Well, one thing early on, we also realized there's different definition of digital twins so we are also using the term digital twin paradigm or digital twin applications uh, infrastructure and then sort of to identify you know when we say digital twin we mean exactly this but it's a very you know abstract concept sometimes so i think yeah that's a that's a good point uh, 
Okay, uh, one more question. So, yeah, maybe a related question. People may be using the same data or each other's data. Are there processes or tools to help with interoperability in the FAIR for research uh, software sense? Particularly given the standards already exist for various enormous data sets and, and are unlikely to change since they come from disparate domains. Uh, yeah, so I, I think um, in, in terms of the FAIR for Research Sense, uh, FAIR for Research really, FAIR for Research software really has been principles up to this point. Um, and so I think the, the principle, um, particularly um, of interoperability, uh, actually does talk about this really almost directly uh, in terms of the uh, software being written to work with, uh, with qualified um, uh, data, for example, and to use um, discipline standards uh, for doing that, uh, community standards for doing that. Um, I, so I, I think the answer to the specific question, though, about are there processes or tools to help with this is not one that I can answer, because I think it really depends on the on the particular discipline. Um, the, the, the principles say that, that that's what we would like to get to, but where, where different disciplines are is, is really up to that discipline. <clears throat> um, and, I, and, I, and I do completely agree that the, 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 the data sets are the data sets. It's, they're, they're not going to change necessarily, but, um, um, but there certainly could be uh, kind of wrappers and, and shims and things like that that help um, uh, transform those data sets or help use those data sets within particular software. Yeah. And, and, and those things themselves then should certainly be fair uh, in order to, or to, to help the ecosystem. Um, I do see, I also see this comment that in the, in the regular chat, as opposed to the Q and A, uh, from Jasper, um, about, about how to apply this when developing twins and, and how one would develop, a, a fair twin. Um, I, I kind of think that's similar to the discussion we've just been having in that, um, and that, uh, at least for me, I don't know the answer to that at this point. And I think the, the, you start off by. Um, by making the, the components fair and then seeing seeing what actually happens when you try to when you try to to search for a fair twin right what's what's important to search for uh, when you try to access something that would be a fair twin right how are all the components accessible is that sufficient or is there something else that's needed beyond the components themselves um, when somebody tries to reuse a fair twin again is it is it just the components that are needed or is there something else that's needed to make that reusability happen um, probably there is, probably there's some kind of, I don't know, some kind of documentation, some kind of higher level metadata that, that talks about how the components actually are the twin or how they are integrated into the twin or how the, how the twin uses them. I, but, um, but I don't know the exact answers. No, I think that's sort of the, the, the route we are also going towards, uh, for example, um, you know, we are also thinking about the fair digital object layer for some of these uh, digital objects coming from different domains. So one idea is that we can at least dictate a minimum set of metadata describing all of those components. And then based on this minimal set of metadata, we can we can forward them to either to the domain specific rich metadata or, you know, forward them to the repository or, or whatnot. But I think that level of abstraction that minimum set, set of metadata is, is, is has to have a sort of a consensus within the community that when when i create a component for the digital twin i have to agree to have at least one two three um right i, I mean i guess the thing that kind of jumps out at me immediately and sorry i, I haven't really thought about this in, in any detail before so that I'm, i may be saying things that everybody here already knows but um but when when that metadata is uh, is defined um there's kind of the, at least three different levels that you could think of it at of, of, right, of, of human readable uh, or human actionable in some sense, maybe they're the same thing, right? Of machine readable and then machine actionable. Uh, and, and so those last two certainly are not the same thing. Um, exactly. yeah. and, and so what, what kind of a, right, what an infrastructure is for uh, either, I don't know, either executing or, or interacting uh, with a digital twin or for the digital twin to Maybe for the digital twin to uh, exist in some sense, um, in a in a live sense, um, I think certainly has to be kind of 
part of that discussion, and I don't have any idea what the what the state of things are now, and and kind of where this project is going to be driving towards. Yeah, we're still in the early stages, so that's that's something. That's why you know we organize some of these webinars now to to also help us think 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 through these things. Um, so yeah, we we also don't have the answer, but I also want to get back to the HPC part on a little bit because uh, within this project we we will be working with Lumi, and of course you know there are other HPC systems that that probably will be using Digital Twin. Um, Particularly, not all of our users or not over all of our stakeholders will be directly interacting with the HPC. There might be a sort of another layer. Um, <clears throat> so, what what do you think that will introduce? Sort of another complication uh, for for the user requirement because it's not a direct interaction. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so that actually it's it's interesting. I guess I wasn't uh, I wasn't thinking of this directly, but the the, the mention that I uh, the thing I said about the fair for virtual research environments is exactly that question. So, um, right. So there so there is work going on in that, and then there's been a, a lot of work on virtual research environments and science gateways. And uh, so there's also there's an Australian uh, there's a third term that's used in Australia for this, and I can't remember what that third term is, but but there's basically these three terms for the similar concept. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, commons, I'm not exactly commons. I think there's a different thing, but uh, thank you. Um, but in any case, there, there is this work that's been going on for, I don't know, a decade or so, or maybe even a little longer than a decade in terms of like, what are best practices to do this? What are the software uh, frameworks in which you can, can build these systems? Um, I, I do think that there's still a lot of interesting work in how these different frameworks work with the different HPC systems, and this is still not um, there's still not really a single kind of answer to this. But there is, but there are people that work on this, um, and so there are tools that are available, and there's discussion about how to make those tools fair as well. So I I feel like there are a lot of the components here. Um, what well, okay, yeah, I'll stop there. Sorry. Um, one of the thing also from the project we will do is that uh, we're also trying to reach out to the to the industry because digital twin is something you know that that probably widely used there compared to research. And I've seen at least in the pharmaceutical industry, there's some uptake about fair at least on the data and the semantics uh, side or ontology side. Um, how do you think that sort of the some of the within the software domain uh more and more uh within the non-commercial in, in, in the industry people are interested in open source and fair uh, how do you think that that interaction could help us or or is there opportunity there to, to, to understand from from the digital twin implementation um I, I again i feel like that's another question that i'm not really sure that i have a very good answer to uh, I, I think um i mean in some sense thinking about industry in general um the the part of industry that's really working on research often or it has a lot of overlaps with uh, with academia and national laboratories that are working on research where people are kind of moving back and forth and a lot of the processes are somewhat similar um, but then when those get kind of moved into production, then things tend to to uh, bifurcate quite a lot. Um, and the the platforms that are being used in industry, if they're cloud platforms, then then things are kind of similar. But if they're kind of in-house HPC platforms, then things can be quite different again. Um, so I, I I don't think that I've again, I, I don't think I have a good answer for this. I guess uh, a suggestion for how to to move forward on this would just be to actually to, to try to have some some interchanges with people that are um, that are working in industry in similar areas and try to uh, again trying to work in a kind of an iterative way and and kind of thinking at a high level um, what's common and then kind of at a detailed level how is it actually implemented and, and what part of that is common and what part of it's different and and if if you can kind of put put things into some kind of a I don't know like a, a stack or a a level, a multi-level architecture, um, right? Where where are things the same, and where do they diverge? And and could there be, I don't know, tools or standards between layers that could help actually um, work with those those differences? 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's a that's an important question. Um, and you you briefly touched about sort of the the support for some of these activities, either either from the funding agency or or institution or, or government. Um, and I think some of these things you you're already doing it. And this is this is also one of the questions I had because uh, uh, after the project ends. This is a this is a three year project, and then we still have to make sure that some of these things are are, are usable for the next uh, iteration. Um, so, do you have any suggestions for how do we convince uh, our funders or other other stakeholders that the importance of, of the fair for software? Um, yeah, it, so it's funny. I was just uh, I was just on a call right before this. Um, so I'm uh, I'm also pretty involved with the Research Software Alliance, as I mentioned, um, and we have a funders forum. Um, where we get, uh, I don't know, we've got about 35 or so different funders that come together and, and talk uh, within that funders forum. Um, they talk, there's a, there's a monthly kind of general meeting and we're just, we're having a, a meeting this morning, right before this was a working group meeting uh, with about, I guess about seven people um, on what funders should be doing with FAIR for research software. And so we're, we're in that group, we're just trying to, to work through this now. Um, uh, so I, I think I think funders are at least a subset of funders are very interested in this and are thinking about it, and and so the discussion was things like, uh, why, how how should these funders kind of make a case for other funders that this is something they should care about, um, how for, how should fair for research software be actually implemented in terms of funder policy, in terms of actual calls, in terms of review processes, uh, in terms of um, evaluation of projects after they've been funded. Um, so I, again, I think there's a lot of, um, there's interest in this and uh, and funders are trying to work through it. Um, from, from the point of view of, I think, what this project can do, I think it would just be to kind of to, to raise this uh, issue to your funders uh, to, to make sure that they're aware of this, that um, in some sense that you feel like the, the work that you're doing um, is important work and the funder recognize that by funding it. Um, but the question about what happens afterwards isn't something that just you can do or just the funder can do. It's something that, uh, that needs to be thought about together along with the uh, with larger community. Um, I think um, it's interesting. So with both, <clears throat> um, both Fair for Research Software and Fair for Machine Learning, we've been working with Elixir quite a bit. <clears throat> and the fact that there is this kind of large uh, community organization, I think, is very helpful um, in terms of thinking about how these different ideas uh, work, how they work with different stakeholders, and how they potentially can work in the long run. Um, and so I, I think maybe that's the, the the question is to think about kind of what's the, the time frame of different entities. Um, so projects being short, uh, researchers themselves having kind of long periods, uh, of, of long lives, uh, funders having long lives, um, and, and kind of what's in between that? What's the kind of what's the equivalent of a of a community organization that's longer than a project, um, right? But uh, but doesn't necessarily go on forever. But uh, kind of something like a you know, like an institute or a center or or something else that, uh, or maybe it's maybe it's a subset of a scholarly society. I, I don't know what the what the right answer is necessarily here, but. Um, but something that's in between a project and forever. Yeah, or RDA groups. Somebody could, could, could be an RDA group. RDA groups, I guess, uh, RDA working groups are intended to be 18 months. So those are even shorter than projects, but uh, mostly, but RDA interest groups could be longer. So that might be a good answer. I mean, I've been, I've been toying with this crazy idea that research infrastructure and software and other things should be run as a utility service, you know, like sort of we, we, you know, because it is part of the public, uh, you know, infrastructure. You know, so imagine all of this research infrastructures. You know, as you, you run your water line or electric line, you know, that that, that would probably have some, you know, higher you know, impact. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's. Um, I mean, that's. I, I think that idea has a lot of uh, positive aspects to it. Um, I will say one of the uh, one of the aspects, at least here in the U.S. and and probably in Europe maybe to a lesser extent is um, kind of when you set up infrastructures and how do you actually how do you actually manage them and how do you ensure that they're continuing to meet the, the needs that they've been set up for over time 
um, rather than kind of them kind of going off and becoming their own their own thing whose main interest is their own survival um, is one challenge. And I think the other challenge is particularly when we're thinking about software and HPC, uh, unlike um, let's say power or water or other kind of utilities, um, they are um, they don't have the anywhere near the same kind of I don't know kind of longevity of investment, right? The the things are changing so often um, that it's not a it's not an issue of invest once and maintain for I don't know thirty years or, or hundred years or whatever the whatever it is, um, but it's it's much more of a an ongoing uh, invest develop maintain uh, with with a much shorter cycle. So I. So again, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know how, how it would work in practice. Um, there's a comment, I don't know if you want to respond uh, about the, the production line uh, for Christos. Yeah. Um, I don't think I really understand that well enough. Uh, I think uh, uh, you sort of yeah. mentioned about the connection with the nature, basically. I mean, that's sort of where we will we we're kind of we're tasked to mimic the, the nature where we don't really have uh, that much control, I guess. That, that's my take. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess I, I feel like in other uh, in other areas where there's kind of a, a research and an industry um, interaction, there's uh, it, it's often um, the, right the the tools and the and the processes that are the the, the things that are kind of carried from one side to another. Um, right, either in some I don't know. In some cases, it's the the research community is building the is building a lot of the tools, and then industry is using them. In in other cases, it's the it's the other way around. Like in, in machine learning, it's it's very hard to build large machine learning models at this point in research. Those are really coming from industry, and then researchers are are kind of treating them almost as black boxes and trying to to research them as opposed to using them to do research. Um, oh, okay, I see. Uh, sorry, thank you, Christos. Um, Yeah, I, uh, I I I don't know the so I don't know the idea. Uh, sorry, the answer to this. I guess the thing maybe the only thing I can think about is uh, is this idea of uh, of natural experiments, um, right? That kind of comes in economics and uh, and astronomy and and other areas where you don't have the where you don't have the ability to actually run an experiment. Um, you can just look at what's happening and try to try to think about um, what you can learn from that in uh, often comparing to to some other part of nature where something different is happening uh, and try to try to treat that as an experiment where you don't actually have control over it but you can uh, but you can just analyze it uh, but i it, this is outside of my area sorry so i'm just guessing a little bit so i think uh, we can probably talk about this for another hour or so but uh, yeah unfortunately we have to cut it short thank you so much uh, for your time and it was really really exciting and thank you everyone for your presentation uh the recordings and the slides will be up uh and uh, feel free to uh send your comments or questions if you have any and thanks again uh for joining us okay yeah th thanks again for the opportunity thanks to everybody who's uh, who's listening and asking questions and and interested Yeah, you, you're muted. Okay, I might hit end for the webinar now. Thank you both so much. That was really informative and very interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.